Hello and welcome back to this second pick microcontroller tutorial and if we just recap quickly over the first video so we looked at a PIC microcontroller so we found that PIC is a brand name from microchip.com and a microcontroller is really a, a very very simple computer on a single chip that only needs a few external components and otherwise which can just run a program all by itself. So we've already seen the MP Lab X IDE, which is here, and we kind of had a quick look at the program in the last tutorial and saw it running in the simulator. So I don't want to do too much extra in this tutorial. I just want to spend a bit more time looking at what our program looks like, our first program in Assembler and in C. So as we mentioned before, when we write programs in C, we get to hide a lot of the details so we don't have to worry about them. They get taken care of automatically. Now that's mostly a good thing, but there are two reasons why that might not always work for you. The first reason is that C code, when it gets compiled, will generally take up more space than the equivalent program in assembler or assembly. And the other problem is that the control of the timing in C is harder to judge because you don't see the pure assembly or the pure machine code when you're writing stuff in C. You just see a much higher level view of your program and obviously it then generates whatever it generates underneath. So where you have something that's timing critical, like some kind of serial controller or something that's talking using some kind of communication protocol, then you might find that C by itself is not what you need. You could either use pure assembly or you can mix the two together. But that's kind of way down the line, really. I want to look at this first program and really take you through all the lines, what's going on. Most of this is kind of the minimum amount of code that you would need for even the most simple program. And as you can see, the assembly requires quite a bit more code than C. But we're going to start in the assembly anyway, and then we'll compare that with what happens in the C program and where the differences are. So first, a couple of things that really are, are kind of common to most languages, most programming languages, is that you need to include, or you don't need to, but it's easier to include a file like this one, which already defines lots of the, the numbers and the address locations that you're going to use in your program. So if I open that, which is somewhere here, uh, open file. So if I open this file, whatever that says, you'll see in here that this defines uh, loads of stuff like where all the different locations for the registers are on the chip, all this kind of stuff. Now, we could write that ourselves in here. But why should we do that when Microchip have already done that for us and they've defined all of these things. So it just saves us a lot of time. So we include that file and the default location in Windows at least is program files, Microchip, blah, 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 blah. In one book that I read, the guy recommended copying all of these to something like um, E colon backslash pick backslash blah, just as a way of, of finding them very easily uh, but that's kind of up to you it doesn't take too long to put in the full path and that points to that file now this is a compiler directive so what this is doing is it's it's kind of a check that says that you know what type of chip that you're using now you might say well i already know that because i've pulled in a file that relates to the pic 16 f84a but of course, the problem might be that I use this program for a different chip. And maybe I change the include, but I don't change this number or vice versa. So this just gives me an extra check. If I try and compile this and I haven't defined that, then you probably saw in that um, file, if we open it again, that here it says if that's not defined, then it shows you a compiler error saying, You've kind of got this, uh, you got this wrong. You need to set the correct chip. 
So we need this line to tell the compiler what we're compiling for, and that's just a load of stuff already included for us. We might as well quickly dive across to C. We have something very similar. The syntax is a bit different because C as a language is different. You'll notice that there's the stuff specific for the 16F84. That's not the same file as that one, by the way. This one is an assembly file and this one is a C file. So they are different, but they've got the similar sorts of stuff in them. And in this case, we also have some common includes for the actual C compiler, the microchip C compiler. So that's kind of the same thing as that. You notice that we don't need that list directive in the C program, but we do in here. And the other thing that's worth remembering is if you get the properties of our project, when you first create the project, you tell it what device you're using. So again, if you don't set that all up correctly, then you'll either get compiler error or you'll try and program your chip and it won't work. It probably won't break, but it just won't work and it might be a bit confusing. Um, so worth mentioning at this point that with most of these things, it's worth having your data sheet. So this is the data sheet for the PIC 16 F84A. They're all available on the internet. Just type in that into Google and you'll find the data sheet easily enough. Uh, and it's worth just keeping an eye on these kinds of things because every one of these picks is different. They have different features, different amounts of memory. Some of the stuff is in a different place. So it's always worth as you go through your program, especially if you've got an existing program that you're moving to a different type of device. So let's say I wanted it to go to the you know, F100, then the F100 might have different stuff. So I, I would need to go down this and I would need to check every line and make sure that I've done it correctly. If I haven't, I might get a compiler error, but I might not. It might assemble fine and then it just doesn't work. So we've covered those two lines. Now, the next thing that we need to do is we need to configure a couple of things on this device. Now, this isn't really part of the program in a sense. This isn't this line isn't going to run as part of the program, but it is going to actually set something in memory on the device before the program runs. And these are really just the important things that we need to know. So the three that we'll worry about to begin with, the first one tells the device what type of oscillator we're going to use to create the clock pulses for our chip. Now, when you're running in the simulator on, on the desktop here, it doesn't matter what you set that to because obviously it's in the simulator, it's just going to work. If you're using a demo board like I am, uh, and one, one day soon, hopefully I'll get my webcam working and I'll put a little picture of the uh, board down here so you can see what I'm talking about. But on my demo board, it has a crystal oscillator, which is the XT bit. So the syntax for this config is underscore underscore. So there are two there, underscore underscore config. And then you and together, so this is what we call a bitwise AND, and it will put all of these together into a single number and put it into the configuration part of memory on the chip. So the first one says that XT says it's a crystal oscillator. There's a couple of other options, RC for a, a cheap resistor capacitor one. There's a couple of others as well. I can't remember what they are. You will find them inside that file. They'll be defined in there if you can't remember. And another thing that's interesting for the configuration bits is it's actually a little um, helper tab that allows you to create this if you can't remember what the syntax is. So you can tell it what sort of oscillator you're using, um, the watchdog timer, the power timer, and the co-protection. You can set these here. And then when you click that generate source to output, it creates you a line that you can then copy and paste into your code. So you can do it that way as well if you want. That's kind of a nice, nice little handy thing there. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is something called the watchdog timer. Now, I'm not going to say anything much about it for now, except that in your first programs, you need to switch it off. If you don't switch it off, it's on by default. If you don't switch it off, then the device will keep resetting very, very frequently. And you might not spot what's happening. It might just look like your program's not working. But what's happening is there's a timer that's supposed to be designed to unlock your program. If something locks up and you, your kind of code is a bit wrong, rather than it sitting there locked up, the watchdog timer resets the device and kind of starts running again. Now, you might think that seems a bit silly, but it's actually quite a useful feature. However, you need to set it up to do what it needs to do. And if you haven't got it set up and you leave the watchdog timer enabled, you'll find that your device keeps resetting and your program won't do what you expect it to do, probably. 
So we turn that off by default. The code protection is useful. If you write to the device and you leave that turned off, then it means you can read the code back again from the chip, from the programmer board. And that could be useful if you're trying to work out what's going on. You might want to read the code back in from the device and say, what, what's, got, what's going on here? If you're writing in production and you don't want people reading your code, you can turn that on and then the code can't be read back off the chip. It's not really massively important, uh, but you might as well leave it off for now. I'm not sure if if you if you can debug. I think you have to have this turned off to, to debug on the device. So XT oscillator is for my crystal oscillator. You can set whatever you need to. Watchdog timer off, code protection off. So that's config. Exactly the same in here. Syntax is different, but we've done exactly the same. XT, that's off, that's off. So we kind of don't need to talk anymore about that. Now, this is where it gets a bit, a bit interesting. So assembly is really a set, in this case, of 35 individual instructions. And each instruction can take a number of arguments. So each of these words is an instruction. And each of them does different things, which we'll look at in a bit. And then these are the arguments that are required for those instructions. And we'll see what those mean in a second as well. And then the only other thing which is optional is these are labels. So a label is useful because we can say go to main. And what that means is when the program gets down to here, it's going to go back up to main. In it is what we call a subroutine. Don't worry too much about that. Think of it like a function if you've ever done any other program in a function or a method. And rather than calling go to, we use the word call. And what that means is it goes into this a bit like a go to. But when it returns here, when it sees that ret LW or the word return, it will come back to here. Whereas with a go to, once you've gone to somewhere, you don't ever come back again unless you just happen to drop down to the same place. So we have labels, we have instructions, we have the arguments to those. So the first of these, which might be a bit confusing if you're used to doing normal programming, you don't have to think of these things. But every one of these microcontrollers has what we call a reset vector. Now, if we go and look at the data sheet, it will make a bit more sense. So the memory on the device is split into two blocks. One of them is what we call the program memory. And the program memory is what this is all going to become. So in this case, it's not going to take up very much program memory because it's a small program. But this is the program mem memory. And the idea is it will go through in order. And, you know, maybe it will use a go to, maybe it will go to a subroutine, whatever. It's going to be kind of going in and out. And it's just going to carry on doing that forever because that's the program. So that's one block of memory. The second block of memory is what we call data memory. And that's uh, a set of registers. We call them registers. They're memory locations, really. But when we write numbers into here, that's how we make the device do something. So if you write to port A or port B, that affects the inputs or outputs of the device. Status does a number of different things. We have the program counter, which is points to the next place that's going to be executed in our program memory. So all kinds of different stuff in there. And depending on the device, this one, for instance, has a writable, what we call an, an E squared prom. So it's programmable read-only memory, which means we can write something to it. And even if the power goes off, that memory is still retained. We call that um, PROM. And this is electronically programmable and erasable. So we have a couple of registers that are just for that. Sorry, the highlighting doesn't work properly. Um, so not all devices will have an E-squared PROM. Some devices will have different things. Some might have an E-squared PROM and 50 other functions as well. So this will vary depending on the device. But this is a fairly basic uh, pick. So it hasn't got too much in there. And then after, in this case, once we get to this place, 0C, these are hexadecimal addresses. We'll look at that in a second. When we get to 0C, the rest of this is what they call general purpose registers. And in other words, that's... that's uh, that's memory that I'm allowed to use for my program. So if I want to save a number somewhere, I can put it into here and I can read it back again. I can do all the stuff I can do with these. I can do with my own memory, except these won't make the device do anything, whereas these will make the device do anything. So uh, what it says here as well is 
You've got a second bank of memory, but in this case, the user memory there is mapped into this side. So you don't get two lots of it. You get one lot and whichever bank you happen to be in, you access the same memory. When you talk about these, we'll look at that later on. You've got to be in the correct bank when you access the memory location. Otherwise, you'll be reading or writing the wrong thing. But let's not worry too much about that. Going back to what we were talking about here. We have a reset vector. Now, the reset vector is very simply the location in program memory that will start running or executing when the device first starts up. Now, you might think it would be really obvious that you'd always start at zero. And that does seem to be obvious. And in this case, it's also true, but it's not always true. Some devices might have the reset vector right at the end. Some of them could have it somewhere else. So you always need to check that because if you don't put that in the right place, then when you start up your program, either it will, won't do anything or it will start up in the middle of your program in a place that you don't expect. So I've checked the reset vector and it says that it's positioned at zero. So I put that in the comment, reset vector is zero. Uh, we'll talk about these numbers just in a second. So what I have to do is I have to use this instruction says, put the next bit of instruction at this memory location. So what I'm saying is I want to hook into my program just using a go to and I'm going to put that memory location zero. So when it resets and it starts running at location zero, the first thing it's going to do is go to start. And guess what that's going to do? It's going to go to start. Now, in this case, because I've taken up a location zero with my instruction here, it then means that everything after that has to start in location one. Now, I don't have to have this line because that's what the assembler will do automatically. If that's at zero, the next thing will be put at position one. But the reason I've done it this way is to make it clear, because let's imagine that the reset vector wasn't zero. Let's say it was, um, I don't know, 3C. Um, and I can't remember what the syntax is in here. That's a bit naughty. Uh, X, uh, 0X3C. Suppose it was that, then that would equal zero. So what I'm saying there is put the reset vector up here somewhere, wherever that might be, and then put the rest of the program down at location zero. So by leaving this here, I've created just a standard pattern for my program that I can always use. But in this case, we're saying that's at zero, that's at one, um, and that's fine. Now, obviously, there's lots of different ways I can do this. We won't worry about program structure too much. I could put that down in here if I wanted. I don't have to do it this way around. But what I'm doing here is I'm kind of breaking up my program and saying, right, this bit here, which we could put in a comment, is the start hook for the reset vector. Something like that. I could say here, um, oh, let's put that, pull that back a bit. Say here, init function. So the idea of the init function, it gets called once only right at the start of my program um, and it will set up inputs, outputs, that kind of stuff. And then I'll have something here which says um, start of main program. And then down here, this can say this is the main loop. So the only reason I've done it in this order is just so we got kind of consistency. Again, we can always use this pattern. That bit will always be the same with the correct addresses in. The init function might be longer than that, might be shorter than that. It's going to be whatever setup we need to do. That then will always be the same because start will always call init. And then once it's called init, init's finished, it returns to here. It will drop down automatically into the next bit. And then because it has go to main, it just sits in this loop forever and ever and ever. And then we have the end. So I could put this all in one block. I could change it around a bit. But what we are, what we are allowed to do here is just get a little bit of consistency. So let's go and look at the init function. We've looked at org. Org is says put the next instruction at this memory address. So that's kind of quite simple. It's like origin. Go to does what you think it does. Goes to the label start. So note that I can't have another label down here called start because there obviously only can only be one. So start then calls in it. So we said that the difference between call and go to is when you call call, it will call this. But as soon as it gets to either ret lw or return, it will come back to here. 
effectively it will go it will remember where it was and it will come back when you call go to it doesn't remember where it was as soon as you leave here it's forgotten about and it will just do whatever it does so we call in it and we do a couple of things here right bcf it means clear the bit in this file register so these things here are file registers uh, again think of it as a file like a file in a filing cabinet and it'll make more sense register is just a memory location so it's literally ones and zeros clear a bit in the file register so because we're saying uh, that we want to do that first of all we need to tell it which file register this one is the status one so I could put that in as an address I could say 0x uh, what was it 3h three, uh, 3 sorry so I could do it like that if I wanted to. But part of the nice thing about a programming language is using human readable names so they make more sense. So the first argument to BCF is the file register. And then the second argument is which bit inside that number do I want to clear? So if we actually pop down to the status register, which is here, the status register does a number of different things. But for now, we're only worried about this RP0 and what rp0 does so it says it's bit 5 but again i don't care that it's bit 5 if i actually go to the definition of that which i can if i open that file i will see that that's defined as bit 5 but i don't need to worry all i know is it's called rp0 it's been defined for me and rp0 says it's the register bank select bits so what that means is which one of these boxes am i going to be using now i need to clear that because i want to use port b and port B is on bank zero. So by clearing that bit in the status register, I'm telling the program to use this side of the addressing block. And then I'm going to CLR is clear. File register. Which file register do you want to clear? Port B. Port B is there. And that is the inputs and outputs uh, it, in this case we're only using an output so in this case they're all outputs but I'm clearing it why am I doing that because if I turn something on to be an output and there's already a one in port b then the output's immediately going to turn on and in most cases I probably don't want to do that so I'm just clearing it if I didn't set that to be zero by clearing it then it might already be set to zero in which case this would still work but if it happened to be set to one and I called clear port B, I would actually clear that one there because it's at the same address. It's just in a different bank. Uh, and again, I might notice that it might cause a problem. It might not. But I need to be careful with bank select on some of these devices. I think on the bigger devices, it has um, has one single block of memory. So you don't always have to bank select. But it's very confusing when you first start doing it, because if you forget that line and something weird happens and you don't know why, it looks like it looks correct, but it's, it might just be because of that. So then I need to do something similar to actually put a number into Tris B. Now, notice Tris B is in the same place, but uh, same place as port B, but it's in bank one rather than bank zero. So before I do anything to Tris B, I need to set so notice that's bsf rather than bcf i need to set the rp0 bit in the status register and set means make it a one and when i make it a one as we saw down here one means use bank one which is the top bit uh, so that's fine so that bit makes sense and then i'm moving a number now there's a couple of um, new instructions so in this case i didn't pass it a number because clear f just means make it a zero so i could actually use that same um same call here and i could clear tris b as well but in this case i might actually want to do something slightly different because i might not want to clear everything i might want to set it to be something like zero f or you know whatever it might be whatever i need to set it to so this instruction says move the literal number that you've put here into something called the working register. Now, the working register is really just a set of hands that takes numbers out of file registers and puts them back in again. So you can't put a number directly into a file register. 
for for some reason i don't actually know why so every time you use a, a literal number like this you have to move it into the working register and then you move the working register w into the file register and there's only one working register so we know where that is but which file register do we mean we mean tris b and tris b is what sets the direction of your inputs and outputs um for in this case port b so we have a port a tris a and a port b a tris b so we're using port b the only reason i'm using port b is because on my demo board port b is connected to four leds so that's useful for me when i'm testing so move the literal number zero and i can define that in a couple of ways like that or like that uh, into the working register and then move the working register into the file register, but make sure I've set the bank select to be the right place. Otherwise, again, it would move the number into port B instead of Tris B. So that's hopefully fairly, fairly straightforward, even though it might be slightly confusing as to, like it's, it's a lot of instructions to do something very simple, but that's just one of the things about uh, microcontrollers. The other thing is if you want to move, say, the number from that file register into that file register, again, you have to move that value into W, and then you have to move w, w into the other file register. You can't move that one directly into that one. So that's that. And then, like I said before, because this is a subroutine, it means I want to go back to where I came from. So this says return and put the literal number into the working register. So the literal number I'm talking about is zero. Again, I could do it like that, like that. That's the same number. When I come back to here, I'm not actually using that number, but it can be used to uh, for a couple of little tricks. It could be used to return an error code. So this could then check the value of the working register and do something if it's not if it doesn't come back as zero or, or whatever. Um, the other thing is you can sometimes use that to return a number to drive a, a seven segment display, or, you know, one of those um, LEDs that has numbers on it. So you can kind of do different stuff, but for now I'm just going to return zero. I don't really care. Um, I could also use the um, the word return and that would do the same thing, but without the number. Uh, which then takes us back to here, so that's fine. And then very, very simply, the actual main loop of the program. So notice that that's all just setting up. We're saying clear everything out of port B, and then once I've cleared everything out of port B, set all of Tris B to be outputs. I'm only using one of them, but because I'm not using the others, I might as well set them all to be outputs. So down here, notice what I'm doing again, clearing the status register. So where do you have to do this? Well, pretty much before you make any call. Obviously, if I was doing, um, let's say I was doing that, and then for some reason I was doing, um, I don't know, say port A, then I don't need to call this again because port B and port A are both in the same bank. But you just need to be a little bit careful when you do it to make sure that you're in the same bank. Select the bank by clearing it. That makes it zero. And then again, like we've seen, bit clear bit set file register which file register port b which bit number two that's output two and that's connected to my led and then one of the things that's important about a microcontroller program is it has to run forever so if it finished here then that would be kind of pretty pointless because this program would run in about a, a microsecond and that would be it it'd be finished so that wouldn't really be much use so Pretty much all the time, you're going to need something that keeps going round in a loop again and again and again and again, and it will keep doing that till you turn the power off or you hit the reset um, button on on the um, on the board. So that's kind of fine. Remember, there's only one program running on the microcontroller, so you don't. Even though this would be wasteful in a normal program, because if you were sitting there going around a loop really, really quickly, it would mean that the other programs wouldn't be able to use the the processor and stuff. But in this case, there is only one program running on the microcontroller, so it makes no difference if we're running in a loop or if we're sitting sitting there doing um, doing nothing at all. So once we get here, it's going to set the right bank select switch. And then it's going to set port B output to. So how do we test this? Well, as I showed you before um, in the last video, we have to hit build for debugging. And then we drop down this line to say launch debugger. When we get there, notice it says that the program stopped because it stops at the beginning. So we hit the reset button, the blue one. And you'll notice that it goes to 
the first memory location it goes to the reset vector which in this case is zero so it's, it's paused which is why there's a little green arrow there um, and it's ready to go so if we hit this little tab down here which is io pins you'll see that i'm looking at rb2 that's the one that we set down here it's called rb2 on the chip if we look up here at the um the pinouts we'll see they're referred to as rb1 rb2 rb3 all the rest of it so rb2 is there at the moment by default it's set to be an input and the value is zero so we can kind of step through this if we want um if we actually go to this so it's going to go to start which is done it's now going to call init so if we step into this one i think that's into isn't it no nope. into okay so it's going to set the bank select it's going to clear port b it's going to move zero into the working register it's going to set the bank to be bank one and what watch what happens here to that d in because I, I'm about to tell it by moving a zero into that, I'm about to tell it to be an output. So when I go like that, that's now an output because I'm, that's what Tris B decides, whether it's an input and output. I'm now returning to where I came from so I can step out and it's going to set the bank select again. And then notice here that the output is zero. And as you would hopefully expect, bit set file register, when I set bit two, that's going to go to one, which it does. And it's just going to sit around doing that. Okay, so it's not going to do anything else. Hit run. It's just going to sit there forever. Um, and that's just going to show you one. Now, you might say, well, if it's done that stuff, um, why don't you just do that stuff up in here and then just have an empty main? You could do. But, the, you know, again, in terms of program design and getting used to program design, you need to think about what's the main job of the of the program doing and in fact, turning on the output is the main job of the program. It's not really an initialization. So it kind of does belong there, even though it might seem a bit weird and a bit contrived. So that's fine. Um, we'll just have a very quick look about how much easier it is in a C program. So in C, your entry point to your program is the is always called main. And that's what the operating system usually looks for to run the program. It looks for the function called main and it executes it. So what they've done here is they've said, well, you might as well call it main. And then the compiler will automatically make sure that the location of that gets put at the reset vector. So I don't have to tell this where the reset vector is. It just kind of knows. But then I have to do the same stuff. But notice I've got no bank select or any of the horrible, nasty stuff. So what's taken me kind of six lines to do an initialization is taken me two lines here. I've cleared port B. And I've set bit two of the tris B to be a zero, which is an output. And then when I come back down to the loop, rather than bank select, it's got one line here, which actually does the business. And then it uses go to to keep going around in a loop. Whereas in the C program instead, we have while. Now, normally you would have something in there like while, you know, variable e equals equals one or something so then if you change that variable you get to break out of the loop but in this case we want it to run forever so we put while one and again it's just going to go around in a loop and do this kind of stuff um so that's obviously much easier like i say it hides some of the detail but actually it's useful to learn this stuff and over the next few tutorials we are going to spend some time learning the assembly because once you've learned the assembly it will then make some of this uh, more easy to understand um, now we could have done a couple of things we could have done um, in it as well if we want so we could follow the same pattern that we did in the assembly and we could put those bits in there like that um, and then we could say in it and hopefully um let's set does that set that as the main project in the c so hopefully that will build yep so let's just double check that it will build for debugging as well which it might or might not <laughs> i haven't tried this one user program stopped hit reset uh it says user program running okay it didn't stop in the same way as the assembly program did but if you notice here it's done the same thing rb2 is out and the modes one so this does exactly the same thing just does it in a slightly cleaner easier way so you can see that there's a number of things that you need to do to get a basic program working the good thing is now you can leave those alone or those alone 
because basically for for the for the short term until we get to about tutorial six or seven we're not going to touch any of those once you've got this set to be a particular pick controller again i'm not going to be changing that all the time the only time i'll need to change that is if i need to use a feature in a tutorial that isn't available on that chip then i'll obviously need to change it for a different device that does support it uh, that kind of stuff again that will only change if that changes and if it does you need to get your data sheet out you need to search for reset vector and it says there the reset vector is at zero 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 um, which is fine and then in the terms of the assembly again you've got some kind of stuff that's fairly standard a lot of this stuff you'll do very often you'll almost always do this because you need to set up inputs and outputs you might have to do port a as well as port b Tris A as well as Tris B, so that might be twice as long as normal. Um, and then down here, it's up to you what, what you want to do, really. And what we're going to look at in the next tutorial is how we handle inputs. So obviously, in one sense, you might think, oh, that's dead easy. And you're welcome to have a go. Have a try, see if you can work out how to read an input. Uh, now, in this case, when you're using the simulator, you can actually do it like this. And you can say when you're running, you can set it to be an input and you can actually tell it then whether to be a one or a zero. So you can simulate a button like that. Or if you've got a, a programmer board like I have, you can program the chip and use the button on the chip. Um, basically, it works in the kind of way you would expect. But there is one thing that you have to watch out for when you're reading inputs and we'll demonstrate it in the next tutorial. But hopefully... That's kind of whetted your appetite a bit. Don't worry if you don't um, remember everything. As we go through more and more programs, you'll start getting more used to the language of these um, commands. There are only 35 of them in total. We've already covered about 10, and there's probably about 10 that you will hardly ever use anyway. So over, over time, as we start looking at them, you'll start to understand them. And then once you're kind of comfortable with assembly, by all means, you see or a mixture of the two. Um, Otherwise, uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Any questions or comments, please put them below and I'll see you in the next tutorial.